The most fundamental part of SQL Server, other than the data, is the transaction lock. It affects our performance, our recovery, our availability. We're going to talk about that coming up next on Tales from the Field. Just do your thing. Wake up. Today's going to be a good day. Wake up. Today's going to be a good day. Wake up. Today's going to be a good day. If this is your first time finding us here at Tales from the Field, give us a like and give us a subscribe. We have content that drops every Tuesday for our community roundtable, and it may feature your content if you are a creator in the community. We'd love to hear from you. Send off in the comments or hit us up on social media. Also, we have MS Tech Bits dropping every Wednesday. This is one of those that you're watching right now. Let's get over to the content. Previously, we talked about acid. Automicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. We focus specifically on automicity. Today, we're going to focus on durability because durability is essentially what our transaction log is. The transaction log is the durable mechanism that makes sure in the event of a hardware failure or a power failure that when our database comes back up and online, that all of the data is in a consistent state. Any transaction that was committed is still in the database. For example, let's say I want to withdraw $1,000 to be able to go on vacation. If I have withdrawn that money from the bank, the transaction is committed, it is durable. Now let's say it was in flight. Let's say that at the moment in time that I go to pull out that $1,000, uh, the ATM crashes, right? It, it hasn't gone through at the bank, the power goes out, the server goes down. They don't just get to go, well, that $1,000 is gone, sorry about that. No, what happens is that transaction is durable. Either it rolls back as if it was never completed and my $1,000 is back in my bank account and I can go withdraw it at a later date, or it has committed, the $1,000 comes out to me and I have my money, so that way the transaction is committed. Now in SQL Server, there's some order of operations things. When the data is changed, it's changed on pages in physical memory. We have a write-ahead logging process in SQL Server for the transaction log, and it writes out that information to the transaction log. It assures that even if that data is not pushed out of memory to the physical hard drive, to the data file itself, that it is still preserved. Now, when we get into Azure, this takes an interesting turn because when we get to a PaaS service, we have to have our database in full recovery because we are managing your backups and your recovery at that point in time. However, when you are on premise or if you're on an Azure VM, you can have simple recovery, full recovery, and bulk log recovery. For this transaction log example, we're going to use simple recovery. Simple recovery can only be had on an Azure virtual machine or if we're on premise on a SQL instance. So this is then this is a transaction log. Each of these blocks are virtual log files. Typically, we can fit multiple transactions in a virtual log file, but for this instance, we're going to pretend transactions span multiple virtual log files. As this transaction comes in and begins to be um, working, what we're doing is we're flipping the status bit from 0 to 2, and you can see we've got these status bits in use. Now, we can say a new transaction will start to come in momentarily. It will flip more status bits. But you can see that our previous transaction is committing, and so it's releasing these status bits, just flipping them back to zero so we can reuse them. In full recovery, this doesn't happen unless we have a log backup to be able to flip those status bits, and the transactions can no longer be active. So we want this to wrap around round. To start off on these demos, we're going to begin on the Linux container uh, for SQL Server 2022 that we created last time in one of our previous videos. I'm going to start on the database that we uh, previously used, Demo Compression Partition. And one of the things I want to show you is a command that's very useful, dbcc SQL perf log space. What this command does is it shows you the transaction log for every database on your instance, uh, what the size is in megabytes, and also this percent of the uh, size and the log used. If you ever get a trouble call in the middle of the night and you're told that a drive is completely full, one of the things I do, I execute this command right away because this helps me understand, is there a transaction log that's gotten out of control that has somehow grabbed all the space in the disk? Uh, and that's a good thing for us to be able to figure out very quickly because we need to shrink it at that point in time. Now we're starting out, again, this is a local instance. This is running SQL Server because there's some nuances in Azure, and I want us to understand everything that's possible in a virtual machine um, running Azure uh, SQL Server or also on-premise. So 
we're going to start with this. We can also dive a little bit further into the log dbcc log info. You can see this gives me my logs, uh, my LSN, my log sequential number, which is very important to be able to recover because we restore the log in sequential order. You can see the sequence number and then the status bits. Two right here is in use. And then I have a zero for everything that is not in use currently. Now, the transaction log will also grow if I have not made it big enough. And one of the things I like to do, people often ask, how big should my transaction log be? You want it to be at least two and a half times of your largest clustered index, because when you rebuild it, you're going to have to maintain the space for the old clustered index and the new clustered index as you're building it. So it's a little bit like moving apartments. That's an analogy I like to use when we're rebuilding an index. Um, I have to maintain the old one for a little while while I'm moving all my stuff out and putting it in my new apartment. Um, so that's just important to understand. And all of that is a fully logged operation. I'm going to need that space in the transaction log. Then I'm going to have to do a transaction log backup to be able to free that space. You also got a DMV because DBCC log info doesn't work on Azure SQL database. So you've got a DMV that can give you the same information. It's SysDM DB log info. So you can see I get my virtual log file information. I've got my status bit right there. I can see my twos. I can see my zeros. A lot of great information in this. Now you do have to supply the DBID. And I just did that by saying DBID and then the name demo compression partition. I could also do a select directly from the transaction log. If I wanted to look at what records had actually uh, been written to it as part of a transaction. Now, this is going to cause overhead. I don't recommend doing this on a production system. You want to play around with this on dev, but this is only something that you would ever use if you have to for a very essential um, reason. But querying FNDB log, I can get this and I can see here's my lot delta count. Here's my clustered index. I can see what's going on for an operation. I can see the allocation unit name. There's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, I can see any description of what was going on for the transaction, the LFs that are added, log records, a lot of interesting stuff. Now let me show you a way to be able to see a little bit more of what's going on for a particular transaction. So I'm going to create a new database called T-Log Demo, Transaction Log Demo, for us to be able to use in this example. And I'm going to create a table in this, and it's just going to be a simple one, my ID, a product description, um, with a default value of some product and product description. Now I'm going to begin a transaction, and I'm going to specifically set the transaction, and I'm going to name it as T-Log Demo. I'm going to declare an integer value, uh, and I'm going to do a quick loop, inserting 20 rows with the product description. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look specifically for this transaction ID from FNDB log. I'm going to do this prior to committing the transaction. And I can see that I begin an insert. I've got an insert going to my clustered index. I can see what table object this is occurring on. For my allocation units, if I take a look at the partition ID, this is going to relate to the object ID for the data file. I can see when this began specifically for the transaction. Um, this is going to be the object locked specifically to be able to acquire the page, the locks to be able to insert the operation. The row log contents, this is in hex, but if I broke this out, this would actually be the contents that I have on the page. And this is the log record. A lot of great stuff that we get whenever we run a transaction. So I'm going to just going to commit this and I'm going to close this window. Now, the next thing I want to show you is how the transaction log works when we do a backup recovery. Uh, so I'm going to put this up in GitHub so you'll be able to access this. And again, you can see these paths are a little bit different. This is because I'm doing this on the Linux subsystem. I'm going to do a backup. Let's take a look real quick. All right, so if I take a look at my demo internal partition, I can see by looking at the options that it's already in full recovery. This is bulk log. This is simple. This is how I would change this if I wanted to change the recovery model on prem or on an Azure SQL VM. I'm going to do a quick backup. I'm going to do a backup of the log. Now I'm going to do a dbcc sql perf log space 
you can see here is my demo internals partition right there. And we've got 26 megabytes and we've got 6.5% that we're currently in use. If I wanted to take a look at this, I could see I've got a status bit two right there and the rest is sitting at zero. Now, if I wanted to alter and again, rebuild the index and create some log records, I'm going to do a DBC SQL per log space before and after. And you can see here's my internal partition. And you can see we're 76% in use at that point in time. So if I want to free this up, I'm going to do a uh, backup. This may still be sitting in memory. So let me do a checkpoint to push this out. There we go. Oh, sorry. Uh, demo and paternal partition. You can see I'm back to 6.55% right there. All right. So I'm going to rebuild my index. Take a look real quick. Demo partition. You can see we're back up to 67% use. Now, I want to make sure that we understand that the checkpoint in and of itself will not clear the log. So if I look at this, it's still at 67. And I can't back up the database and have the backup actually log this. So let's do a full backup. And I can see my full backup processed but it doesn't really matter. I've still got 67.7% in use. So what I have to do is I have to back up our log. And then I can see I'm actually down now to 5.9%. So one of the things that's important to realize is if I take and run a transaction against this, all right, so that's going to start running. When I take a look at my log space, I can see I've grown and I've also got 99% in use. So if I come back over here and I do a log backup, I can see it didn't change at all. And the reason is these, the transaction log is being held in use. See all these status bits? There's my status bits too. I've got some status bit zeros, but the majority of my log is being used. And it looks like I've probably grown. So if I commit the transaction, and I come back over here, I'm going to do a DBCC SQL per before and after. I can see here we go, 72%, 74%. Oh, I probably needed to give this a second. Yeah, I, I, I queried this too fast the last time around, but you can see we're down to 6.7%. So this has freed up the space, but the only thing can, that can do that is if we use a log backup and if an active transaction isn't running against it. The active transactions running will hold a lock on the virtual log file as we're doing it. So this is a little bit about how the behavior of the log file is. Let's take a look at a little bit more about recovery. So one of the things I can do is I can restore this I'm going to restore it from our backup file that we did. I'm going to take a look at this. I'm going to take a look at the number of rows that we have. You can see we've got 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick backup. I'm going to do a backup, and then I'm going to do a transaction log, and then I'm going to set this in no recovery. And what this will do is this will take our database and make it to where it's inaccessible. It's in a restoring state. Now what I can do is I can bring it online and I can show you how we do a piecemeal restore to be able to recover this. So if I had a very large database, I, I've had customers before like this, where maybe we've got 24 terabytes and the actively in use database is only, let's say about a terabyte worth of data, 23 terabytes is historical data that we have to keep for legal and compliance reasons. I, if I have a failure, restoring that 24 terabyte database is going to be a very big operation. 
So what I want to do is I want to be able to partition this database, bring on the hot data specifically in the partition where the hot data is located and bring on the archival data um, a little bit at a time. So I'm going to simulate that experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restore my individual partitions. If we think about the query that we previously ran, we had six partitions. I'm going to bring five of them online. I'm going to do this from my data file and from my transaction log. And we can see that these data files are brought online. And now I can go and I can use my database and I can say, give me select star from records 5,000 to 9,000. And everything comes back just fine. But if I were to try and run this from 10,000 to 5,000, it's going to say, oh no, uh, partition six, file group six, uh, that's not active. As you can see, this resides on a partition that cannot be index, uh, accessed by the index because it is offline, restoring, or defunct. This may limit query results. So that's also an important thing to keep in mind. If you want to be able to use this, you've got to be able to have a where predicate value that limits your data uh, to specifically those file groups that are online. Select star from is going to be a little bit of your enemy when you're restoring things in a piecemeal restore. If I want to do a select count from, this should also throw an error because one of my partitions is offline. So now I'm going to restore partition six. And as you can see, I can not only execute the same query, but I can execute the count. Everything comes back just fine. So we just covered a lot about the transaction log, but trust me, there's even more that we could still potentially learn. We talked about how it behaves in simple recovery model. We showed a demonstration of how it behaves in full recovery model and only a transaction log backup can actually flip those status bits. And then we talked about how to do a piecemeal restore. Keep in mind, that's only going to be something that we can do and utilize if we are outside of the PaaS service, if we're with SQL Server on a VM, or in this case, SQL Server on a container for us to be able to play around with. I'm going to put all these scripts up in our GitHub repo. That's going to be down in the description below. Please feel free to access this, play around with this at your convenience. You know where you like to keep this going in the comments. If there's any questions, anything you'd like to see, uh, anything you want to hear from, let us know. Thank you so much for being with us. Take care, one. How you make it? Set a goal you control and the steps you take them. I try to pick one thought, have some concentration. And if I make a mistake, it's